Alright everybody, welcome back to Carburetor Tuning Part 2. Let's see if there'll be a Part 3. Alright. So in the interest of full disclosure, I had not intended to make this carburetor video a two-part video. However, I think I mentioned it in the last one that I'm having problems getting a low idle. And when I redid the throttle discs and replaced the throttle discs, and specifically the, the spindles, I didn't really pay particular attention to how the throttle discs landed when they were shut inside the throttle body. Unfortunately, I'm going to take the carburetors back off and check that, and I'll show you what I'm looking for and kind of how to adjust that. I, I, I pretty pretty confident I understand how to make it better, but obviously idling at a, a 1,000, 1,200 RPMs when the workshop manual calls for you know half of that is, uh, is not going to work. So a little bit of work here to get the carburetors off. It's pretty easy. It's only two bolts uh, per carburetor. This guy here and one underneath, and then you've got all this linkage that you got to kind of keep track of. These aren't uh, bolted to the carburetor all they're just kind of set and pinched in there between the two they're cut so that they fit in the in the little the little recesses in the in the nuts and everything get a uh, few lines disconnected get all that stuff off got gasoline in the float bowl so i have to take care of that make sure i don't make a mess and spill gas all over the place but we'll get that knocked out and uh, i'll get it over to the bench and show you what's up got the carburetors off the car going to go ahead and separate them take the float bowls caps off dump the gas into uh, just a container here you could probably see there's little specks of rust on this just over the summers the car sitting in the garage here has uh, gotten really humid obviously on a couple days so there's some sporadic pieces of rust throughout so I'm going to use the fluid film the same stuff that I used inside the sills and just coat those pieces that that I think are less susceptible to rust so go ahead disassemble everything here break it down get the gas out of it and I'll show you when I can get them in my hand and move them without fear of spilling stuff what uh, what's shaping up. These little adjustment clips and everything are all kind of the same, but what you can see is the top of the bolt head is here and it rests inside of a little recess in there that allows you to loosen the nut and not have to worry about grabbing something on the other side. So it's almost like a self-locking thing that allows you to loosen and adjust and all that. So when you put these on, you want the nut side sticking up at you so you can get at it because you'll know that this side will be captured and it's not going to rotate on you so you don't need to get two wrenches on it it's convenient yeah, and the reason i took this apart is just to start with the um the fluid film stuff just to get this stuff ready to, to go i'm going to spray it all down stick it in this big bucket here and just just let it soak for a little while while i work on the uh, everything else So even though that looks like a solar eclipse or something, it's not. That's the throttle disc and the amount of light that's coming through between the throttle disc and the body of the carburetor itself. I'm going to open it just a little bit. You're going to see it get really bright. So obviously, not only is it not flush on the body, but you're going to be letting air in. So light, in this case, is equal to air, more airflow, more fuels drawn across the carburetor, regardless of the amount that the throttle is open right, because it's gonna create a vacuum behind it and it's gonna suck the fuel out of that jet and that's gonna increase my revolutions per minute. 
So hopefully looking at this, I'll be able to adjust it and get some, uh, get some of this light to go away. So there's two screws in here. Now these screws are kind of split screws. They're lock screws. Obviously you don't want these screws rolling out on you and then getting sucked into the motor and uh, causing damage. A uh, quick little story back when I was in high school, I had a 76 MG midget with a big old Weber 40 DCOE carburetor on it that I was playing with and forgot to put some lock washers on the little itty bitty nuts that held on the air filter and over time sucked two or three of those nuts in and ended up cracking a couple pistons, damaging the head and learned my lesson really quick about that stuff. So I do have new screws here and I also have Loctite. I'm gonna use both. I didn't really bend these screws out that much. So I'm hoping I'll just be able to loosen them and then retighten them. But essentially all I'm gonna do is loosen the two screws, which you can't see right now, move that throttle disc around and try and get it centered up and then, and then put it back. So that's, that's the plan here and we'll see what happens. Well, it doesn't really appear that I can get it much better. I guess that's a little bit better over to the right there. It doesn't look as bad as it was, but essentially, turn the light on, watch your eyes. Essentially, all I did was loosen these two screws up. I didn't pull them all the way out, and then the throttle disc will kind of float. So I loosened it up and, and let it kind of float in there, and then I'm just turning back to try to get it as closed as possible, and then tapping on it to try to make it get self-centered. I'll show you an old one here. So you can see in there, there is an adjustment hole. You can, this hole is a little oblong, but these things are not perfectly circular and it's probably hard to see on there, but you can see it holding it in your hand. They're oval and they also have chamfered edges. So they only really go in one way and they, uh, they're quite centered. So I don't believe they're designed to have a perfect seal, but hopefully this is getting better than it was. So now that I'm, I'm about as good as I'm gonna get on that one, and this one, uh, by the way, like I said, is the rear one, and this was in a little bit better shape comparing the flow noise. I'll go ahead and tighten this up and then move on to the next one and see, hopefully I'll see a, a more prominent change. All right, and then once you get it all tight, you wanna rotate it and make sure that you're, uh, you haven't bound it in there because it's very easily bound, so that looks pretty good, operates pretty smoothly. I got the uh, linkages here kind of taken apart a little bit just to get them cleaned up and get them in that, uh, that fluid film. So I'll go ahead, put this guy back together, get the other one to this state and see how that one looks. So you probably don't even need me to turn out the light to look at this one. This is the, the front one, the one that I knew was sucking too much air. Wait for me to turn this light off. This is really bad. Oh, so yeah, so that's, that's uh, an eclipse that's almost over. So obviously this one needs to be adjusted. So hopefully this will, uh, this will alleviate a lot of my problems and, and hopefully allow me to tune these a little easier. So I'll go ahead, same process, just go ahead and clean it up, get, the, get those two screws loose, and then go ahead and get, them, get the thing centered up as best I can and get them retightened. And then uh, should be able to start reassembly. All right, so I think that's a lot better. That actually looks even a little bit better than the other one. You can just barely see, it looks white on the screen, but it's more of like a brass colored, which tells me that there's very little clearance so that works. I'll go ahead and uh, get this guy back together and we'll move on. So I got the carburetors back on. I'm gonna go ahead, get the, uh, the float bowls primed up using the, uh, the little lever on the pump, the fuel pump. Go ahead and get the car started and see uh, how much of a difference I've made. All right, going ahead and start the car. I got the uh, float bowls primed. A little quick little shot of starter fluid in each throat just to give it a little oomph there. And I have the idle adjusting screws dialed all the way down. So it may not start. You're supposed to prime these at about a turn, turn and a half, so it may not start. We'll see. All right, so it's just barely idling. That's a good sign, I guess.
All right, that's rated at about 1,000 RPM right there. Let it warm up. All right, so you see I got this little piece of tubing here. It's just a piece of fuel line. I don't even know what diameter it is. Doesn't say. So whatever that diameter is. But I had some larger, larger diameter stuff like this when I was listening before, and it's easier to gauge in here. Now right now I've got a complete opposite. Right now they're both sucking about the same according to the noise. But if I flip the throttle here, this one's getting a little hung up. It feels like it's sticking. You can hear it idles out a little bit higher. And that one came down, but that one's real high. So if I push on it, it obviously stops. So I'll see if I can figure that out. All right, so it's been a couple days. It's actually Sunday now, the uh, 29th, no, 30th, excuse me, of August. So I've taken the carbs on and off a couple times trying to get this uh, this throttle to not hang up, and it's not it's not really playing but uh, I'm going to continue on with the adjustment. Essentially what's next is to do the, the mixture and the same stuff that I used when I was idling or centering the jets, excuse me, these bottom adjustment screws here, these are 5 8 inch. What you do is you essentially adjust the height of the jet with that so that the needle on the piston is all the way down in the jet. So if I raise the jet, I'm going to weaken the mixture because I'm going to put more of the needle in the jet. If you can reference that so instead of moving the needle and now I'm moving the jet if I run it out and make it go lower then I'm going to richen the mixture because I'm going to be pulling the jet away from the needle so it's it's a little backwards it's a little odd to think of it that way but that's essentially how it works all right I'm back it's uh, Thursday about uh, 26 or so I had some other work to do so I'm back to play with these cards. I've done some research, I've done some homework. I think I've got uh, at least a little bit better understanding. Some of this stuff may repeat depending on how I edit this. So if I kind of speak again, it's because I got a couple days in between and I don't quite remember everything that I talked about. But I'm to the point now where I've got the jet centered. I got a nice knock on both pistons. I've refilled the pistons with oil. Now I'm going to start the car up, warm it up, let it sit here and, uh, and run it for a little bit, let it get up to normal operating temperature and then I'll continue on using this, uh, this SU carburetor pamphlet here to continue with tuning. Alright, so I tried to speak loud enough so you can hear me. This is the Unisys, or Unison, excuse me, airflow indicator and essentially it will allow you to measure the vacuum. Adjusting nuts on all carburetors up to weaken or down to richen the same amount until the fastest idling speed consistent with even running is attained. Well, I already know which way I need to go with these, so I'm going to play with this. Again, the adjustment nuts are the ones on the bottom, right? The locking nuts are the one on the top, and they should be nice and tight. 5 8 inch wrench for these. Now, again, I think the front carburetor is just a little bit too uh, weak or too lean, and the rear carburetors. A good, a good amount rich. Usually you can do this with your fingers. You don't always need <coughs> to do it uh, with a wrench. So I'm going to screw it up. The RPM may change a little bit. Not screw it up really, hopefully. Screw it up. You know, screw it. Uh, and then still use this Unisys thing here to try and see if I can figure out how rich, rich or weak it is. Just a little bit. 
much no change there. So I'm going to go back and kind of split the difference to four and a half. Alright, so it rises just a little bit, which is essentially what the thing tells you. It should come up just a little bit. <coughs> so we'll check the front one again. Alright, so that's definitely slowing down. So I'm going to back the jet out, right? Again, I'm going to lower the jet away from the needle. So we'll go and turn one flat out. And this is working just fine with my fingers, by the way. Alright, still too much. That's another way to do it is you lift a little piston and if it stalls, obviously it's way too weak. So it's telling me it's still way too weak. Another flat. I think this will do it. So I think that's halfway decent. All right, so I think about, about as good as at least I understand to get it. I've tightened up the throttle leakage screws and the, and the um, choke screws. I'm going to get that choke cable out of the way, take it around the block. And uh, I've also discovered a, a brake leak for my brake caliper up here. I'll show you that maybe if I get to that point. But uh, I think I'm I think I'm 90% of the way there. So we'll, uh, we'll continue on, take a quick little trip, and I'll be back and tell you how it did. Definitely did better. It still doesn't feel like I can really get on it without uh, causing it to bog down. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay where she sits for now. It'll, you know, it'll drive. But now what I'm gonna do is adjust the choke. Let's see if I can get the choke figured out because I was having problems with that before. So essentially what this tells you is you reconnect the mixer control wire, which is the choke, the choke wire about a sixteenth of an inch free movement before it starts to pull on the jet levers. So I'll zoom in there and I'll pick the camera up and show you what's going on down here. So when you choke these cars, much like when you step on the accelerator, the jet moves out and up and away and allows more fuel. What you're doing when you choke the cars, I'll show you this, you can see the jet moves down. So instead of it moving the piston, it moves the jet and essentially accomplishes the same thing, right? It's all relative to where that jet is standing. So when the car is cold and you want more fuel, you can pull on the choke cable and essentially that's connected in here and there's a little um, screw that attaches in here and pushes that choke cable up and you get some good amount of play in here. You can see how it's sprung, some good amount of play until you actually start to move the jets. You reconnect the mixture control wire with about a sixteenth of an inch free movement before the before it starts to pull on the jet lever. So that's gonna be sprung already. And then you pull the Mr. Control knob until the linkage is about to move the carburetor jets and adjust the fast idle screws, which I'll show you here in a second, for about 1,000 RPMs, one hot. So I will have to restart the car here in a little bit, letting her cool off. So I'll go ahead, reconnect the, the jet, put a little bit of tension on the springs, or reconnect the cable, excuse me, put a little bit of tension on the springs to start the car up, and then we'll, uh, we'll show you what I'm doing there, at least, I hope so. So addition to pulling the jets away when you lift the clutch, this little arm here, this little cam is situated on the clutch and you can see how that rolls. If you find the other end of that, there's a little screw down here and that screw right there is connected to the butterfly throttle. So you adjust that screw until you get about a thousand RPM is what it says with the engine hot. So. Right now, the, the jet is just about to move, and that's where it's set up. So I should adjust that screw now to give me about 1,000 RPM. Now, the problem is, is the car's already running at about 1,000 RPM. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust that screw until it just barely touches that cam. So that essentially will tell me that that's at zero point. So when I do pull on the choke, that cam will immediately start moving. It'll immediately start to push that throttle open and then give me that choke. The, um, the other thing kind of going on here is choke is hanging up so when I 
when I pull the cables out, these, these jets, you could just see that just then actually don't always reset to zero. I'm not That one's not either. Um, I cleaned them up, I, I WD-40 them, I lubricated them, I'm not quite sure. Uh, my guess is they're kind of binding in the jet collar a little bit and I'm not uh, not real sure how to, how to handle that. So that's, uh, if anybody's got any ideas about that. I'm not real worried about the choke. I'd like to get it working just because I'd like to get the stuff to work but I'm not real worried about having to use the choke all that much uh, just because she's gonna, be a, she's gonna be a seasonal car. So I'll play with it a little bit, but then I, uh, I'm gonna take this tire off and check out the brake caliper. So yeah, I pull the choke too far and the car stalls, so it's not working real well. But again, I'm not gonna worry about that now. I'm gonna get this tire off, see if I can figure out what's going on. One thing that clued me in is, and you're not gonna really be able to see it, maybe, the back of the tire got real shiny, like it had uh, grease or oil on it. And I wasn't really noticing anything up here, but then I stick my hand underneath the, uh, the brake caliper down there and I'm getting a little bit of fluid. So, not really losing any. It's not dripping. I'm not noticing it out of the master cylinder, but it must be coming out somewhere, obviously. That's obviously going to contribute to my sponginess on my brake as it slowly bleeds when I step on the brakes. So, I'm sure it's something like that. So, I'm going to take the tire off and see what I can figure out. One of the nice things about this car, obviously, is the amount of room you get working, especially in the suspension and down low here. The calipers are rebuilt, and also I split them. Now, a lot of people don't like to split the calipers because there's a little rubber seal inside of there, and they figure that you take it apart once, and you'll never get that seal right again, and I just didn't believe that. The other thing is that there is no torque value for the bolts, advertised torque value for the bolts that hold the caliper together. However, if you watched my videos, uh, my series on uh, torquing uh, nuts and fasteners and stuff like that, you can find acceptable torque values for standard size nuts in the absence of that. So essentially that's what I did. So I'm gonna pull the, pull the brake pads out. I have a feeling they're gonna be a little soaked. Little pins in there. Knock the pins out. Cleaning this stuff up as I go. You can get rebuild kits for all this stuff. You'll get all this stuff comes new. Yeah, there's definitely, definitely fluid in here. So either I've got a piston leaking. Yeah, Let's see that? Piston leaking or what I suspect is it's leaking where I took it apart. Yeah, you can see how wet that got. It's holding on to the brake dust. So I did not, uh, these are not my new brake pads. I do have a set of new brake pads. I actually need to find them. But they're, they were, you know, obviously in very good shape, so I didn't replace them. Waiting for when the car is on the road. Yeah, these pads are, these pads are soaked. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'll take, take the caliper off the suspension here and see if I can figure out where it's leaking from without removing the brake hose quite yet. So this is a uh, 5 8 inch nut. Torqued, uh, torqued pretty good. 40, 50 foot pounds, I think. I did buy new bolts when I got these new hardware. It's one of those things where I figure brakes are important enough that you want new hardware. Now you gotta watch here because you got a brake hose and you got your paint and all that stuff. You don't wanna do any damage. Get it loose. Yep, bolt's all soaked. That one's really full of fluid. All right, and you want to try to hang the caliper if you can like that so that you don't cause any damage to the hose. Put stress on the hose. Go ahead and get some of this cleaned up here real quick. Here, I don't see any grease from the bearing or anything like that, so that's pretty indicative that it's definitely the uh, break here. However, what I do see is there appears to be brake fluid hanging out right here around this washer here, this copper washer. And I wouldn't expect if the brake caliper on the rubber seals are leaking that it would go up. So I have a feeling that maybe it's the copper washer, which would be very convenient. 
All right, let's see if I have an extra copper washer lying around somewhere. I'm not sure that I do. All right, so it appears that I do have an extra copper washer right here. As far as I'm concerned, these things are single use. They, uh, they crush to seal. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that washer that's on there, remove the brake line that's on there, remove the copper washer, replace the copper, clean it up as best I can, replace the copper washer. Uh, unfortunately, it's gonna cause a mess and I'm gonna lose brake fluid. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to get away with not having to bleed the brakes again, but that's okay. So one thing I will point out about these rubber boots here, there's a pretty thin sleeve on the caliper itself, a little groove there, and there's a little itty bitty groove inside the piston. And one side of this rubber boot goes on the groove in the piston, and the back side goes on the groove on the caliper. One of the more difficult things I've had to do with this car was to get this thing together like that. So I gotta try to refit this one and, uh, and get it on here properly. But I'm gonna do the rubber washer first because it's infinitely easier. All right, so I got that loose. I'm gonna go get a little cup to catch the brake fluid. I do have a good amount of brake fluid in the master cylinder. So like I said, I hopefully I'm not going to uh, drain below and suck some air in here. Right, try to clean, the, clean that face up. So I'm trying to keep my thumb over the hole here so I don't lose a whole bunch of brake fluid. And I'm going to lose some brake fluid out of this, the, uh, the brake caliper as well. Try to let that fill up a little bit. Slip the brass copper washer on. Clean that face up as good as I can. All right, so that's relatively clean. New copper washer, get that nice and clean. Get that on there. Now when I do this, I'm gonna keep the caliper straight up and down so that I don't dump any fluid out of it. So I'm just gonna lose some fluid as I screw it around, but that's okay. Well, that was a little bit more painful than I thought it would be. Sits that up a little bit. Replace the copper washer, this little guy. This one is, uh, it's not really in horrible shape, but it's not sealing. The reason I think it was the copper washer and not the caliper where I split it was because I had fluid up at the top and the seal for the, uh, the calipers I think it's on this side, so I would have expected it to only go down and not gotten over here. So it might be a little bit of a long shot, but so I made an absolute mess trying to get that cable back on or the hose back on, spilling brake fluid all over the place, but hopefully I didn't air introduce a whole lot of air into the system. So I'm just going to go ahead and clean it all up as best I can, right? I want to get it nice and clean because I want to be able to see if I've got more fluid somewhere and then go ahead and get it remounted. Oh, well, I was playing with putting the brakes back in, the pad separated from the backing, so obviously that's not going to work. Glad it didn't happen when I was driving the car. So I just hung the caliper up here, dried it, and cleaned it as best as I can. I don't expect any leakage now, you know, in this state without any pressure on the pedal, but who knows, maybe I'll get some. So I'll just leave it and find the brake pads that I have at home somewhere and uh, work on that next time I'm here. Got my new brake pads. I picked these up. These are County Brake Pads. County makes... Um, Halfway decent aftermarket parts in my experience. Uh, my pistons are county. They have uh, they make master cylinders and uh, remanufactured parts like that. So if you can see these two little circles in the back of it, what it appears to be that that's brake pad material. So what it looks like is not only is the brake pad glued to the metal plate, but it's also cut such that those little circles fit in and through the metal plate and provide just kind of extra penetration I guess or maybe a little bit better of a way to adhere it so that's a that's a pretty good idea this has been sitting for a couple days now it's Saturday and I don't see any fluid but not that I necessarily would expect it there's nothing on the bottom there's no no uh, no wetness on the bottom but again this is just gravity that would cause this so I'm gonna put the brake pads back in get uh, probably get the uh, the mighty vac on here and bleed this real quick check my level obviously in my master cylinder 
and then probably take it for a little spin. All right, folks, that's all I got. Thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment below and tell me what you think. Well, no leaks, so it looks like uh, hopefully the, the brake thing is fixed. And, uh, yeah, the car's still not running right. i got to uh, revisit some of these carburetor things. I think the big deal is I just I don't have any experience, and I don't know what it sounds like or looks like to have it done right. So I'll keep looking, keep researching. I'll get it done. Thanks again. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers.